They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good afternoon. It is 401 Tuesday, September 27th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And if you haven't heard yet, this is my last show hosting the Writers Room. So I want to say once and for all, Bill, I hope your dear Patriots win the Super Bowl. Uh, Joe, don't even start with me. You know I hate the goddamn Patriots. Now, he got me all, I'm, I'm ready to do a great show. I'm riled up. But speaking of the team that really does matter to me, the Boston Red Sox, once again, Seth Clareman, part owner of the Boston Red Sox, I'm still waiting for him to get in touch with me. Seth, I got all sorts of thoughts and ideas to share with you how to fix this mess you guys have created in Boston. You know where to reach me, Seth. Come on, pal. He's busy this week. He's going to be yeah, busy this week yeah. with tatter sauce, but we'll try to get him on. So – Replacing me or John, one of us coming on the show going forward is the great host and analyst from XBTV, Zoe Cadman. And Zoe had a little bit of an initiation this week watching the writer's room. Zoe, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, first off, guys, I am just so excited and delighted to be here joining all of you. But I, I was listening to the writer's room last week and I had a long journey back from Kentucky and I, I was listening to it. and I was like, my God, how many times do they say the F word in this show? The F word being flight line. Be careful, Zoe. <laughs> I know, right? So I said to some of, my, some of my friends, Dan Ross, who writes for you guys, is a very dear friend of mine. I hadn't seen them in over three months. And uh, I said, let's play a, a drinking game called the flight line at drinking game. So we played back your podcast. And every time someone said the F word, we drank. Dan Ross has it all. <laughs> I am. Of course. I lost the drinking game. <laughs> we talked to you about this two weeks ago when you were on the show. We talked about Flightline. Yay! Yay! That Flightline is going to go stand that name down. Two. Let's put a little, uh, can we put a little on the if it's red, can we drink two drinks? Okay. Yeah. Now, under Andy Ross Peter to see Flightline in 2020. Mm, Flightline. I, I pride myself on being an optimistic class half. Flightline totally. money. Oh. We sell. I mean, we've been beaten over the head for the last quarter century. Majority owner of Flightline. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Jess. I'd like to see the horse continue. The chances of Flightline flight flight in my world are higher, certainly. But definitely, Flightline in money next year are higher. It's ready, Moss personally guarantees that Flightline. Yeah. 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 Hey, let, let's say, let's say Flightline. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let right. me just yeah. say, yeah, yeah. this should be a PSA service announcement with that drinking game. Do not play this unless you have the day off the very next day because <laughs> it, it was not pretty yesterday. Yeah, Zoe had a slow start to her first writer's room week, week because of that. <laughs> Honestly, I thought I was a little disappointed. I thought you guys were going to do a full drink every time, <laughs> but I guess you would have been in the hospital then. Sue already warned me that she said, just take two sips. They say yeah. flight line a lot. So, yeah, yeah, thank you, Sue, for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're, th we're thrilled to have Zoe on. Well, what an intro. What a great intro. Couldn't do it any better. The TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland. Returning this November, the Keeneland will offer a single session dedicated to racehorses on the final day of the November sale, which is November 17th. Entry deadline is September 30th for the print catalog. However, supplemental entries will be considered until sale day. We had a big day of racing at parks on Saturday, and there was a little, little bit of a kerfuffle on the backstretch at parks as well that we're going to get to a little later in the show. But let's talk about what happened on the track. The big races, obviously, were the Pennsylvania Derby and the Cotillion. A really devastating performance by Tava, I thought, in the Pennsylvania Derby. There were some, I think, some fair questions about him going into the race because he had he had started so hot, especially with that Santa Anita Derby win. There was really nowhere to be found in the Kentucky Derby. Came back and ran well in the Haskell, but not, not necessarily well enough to think that he was going to jump towards the head of the three-year-old class. He left no doubt in that race on Saturday. He was terrific. And I think he's the kind of horse that would really benefit from coming back as a four-year-old because I still think he has development to come. Now, it's a tough year for a three-year-old to really match up against the older horses, especially because of 
won't say his name, Zoe, but <laughs> Thank it's, you. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a tough year to make a dent in, against the older horses. But in a normal year, I think that he would be one of the top contenders for the classic. He's getting good at the right time. And that was a good field. That was a legitimate grade one million dollar race. And he made short work of those horses. He also slammed the door, I think, on any idea that anybody other than Epicenter was going to win the three or the champion three-year-old male Eclipse Award. And I think the Cyberknife was the only one that had even a sliver of a chance to do that. And Cyberknife obviously was no match for Taba on Saturday. Bill and Zoe, what did you think about the PA Derby? Well, Joe, one thing I'll disagree with you, what if um, Flightline does not win the Breeders' Cup Classic and Taba does? I think that, I mean, we don't think that's going to happen because, you know, most of us are are just thinking that the flight line will, it's just a matter of how far he wins the race by. But I think if he combines the Breeders' Cup Classic with what he's accomplished this year, he has a very good case for Horse of the Year. Um, I was waiting for this kind of performance from this horse. And reason why is, you know, look what he, what they had tried to accomplish with him. Going in the Santa Anita Derby in his second career start, going in the Kentucky Derby in his third career start. Um, he wins the Santa Anita Derby, doesn't run well in the in the Kentucky Derby, but it was too much too soon for this horse. Then he comes back in the Haskell, runs well, but he looks like a horse in the Haskell that, you know, is there more? Just like you said, Joe, is there something more? And yes, there was. You know, this horse, I think, for the first time really showed us what he can do. And, you know, we didn't get the epicenter Taba matchup. I mean, what, any way you slice it, they're the two best three-year-old Colts in, in the country right now. As, as good as Cyberknife is and as consistent as he is, I think he's at best number three behind these two right now. And he put in a tremendous performance. Um, you know, and is he the champion? Well, again, we'll see what happens there. But, you know, right now, I think he might be every bit as good as Epicenter. I mean, correct me if you, you disagree with that. And so I'd like to see what you have to say about that. This was a terrific performance, and this was a very good field. There were the winners of, of, of five grade one races in there, including Cyberknife, the uh, two-time grade one winner of the Haskell and Arkansas Derby. Zandon wins the Bluegrass. White Iberio, who wins the um, – uh, Florida Derby. It was a stacked field, a very good race. And, you know, he just, he really was a man among boys in that race. I was very, very impressed. I, I'm going to echo the same sentiments. I think he's basically a young horse mentally who is finally figuring things out. And a lot of people critiqued Mike Smith ride in the Haskell for going 15 wide. But the truth, Matt, the fact of the matter simply was he didn't like being inside. It was the first time he got kicked back. We've all seen on XBTV how Bob works his horses. They don't sit behind other horses in old school ways and learn to eat dirt. So the fact he'd never really had any dirt kicked in his face, sent him backwards. Mike had no choice but to go around horses. And I think he definitely learned an awful lot in the Haskell. And he did sit behind horses. He still came around at the end of the day. But this is a horse who I think is getting better and better and bear in mind that Speed was very, very kind to the front runners all day long. This is a horse who actually sat off the pace. So I think we're just reaching the tip of the iceberg. And if he stays in training next year, I'm really, really going to look forward to that because he's not an overly big horse. He's a compact horse. I've seen him enough times in the morning. But I think mentally, he's just been behind the eight ball. And I think he's just getting it together. And the fact that Bob opted to keep Mike Smith on him says an awful lot because Mike knew he was being critiqued for all the wrong reasons. And yeah, we know what Mike is now. Mike likes to go wide and that's fine, but he still can be brilliant at the best of times. So I think the best is yet to come with Tabor. I really, really do. Yeah. I mean, you know, Money Mike has that nickname for a reason because, you know, a lot of times when he's riding the best horse, your job is simply not to get the horse in trouble. Just keep the horse in the clear. Right. And I, you're right that I think sometimes – he gets caught with his pants down a little bit when he does that. But overall, I think that's the right strategy when you're riding four to five favorites, three to five favorites. Don't try to get cute. Don't try to squeeze through. Just keep the horse in the clear. And it works out usually when you have the best horse. And Table was clearly the best horse. I think what's interesting about him is that he has shown those multiple dimensions. He's got a lot of speed. He won his debut going six furlongs, but he's able to sit off the pace and make one run. I think that that's going to that's gonna be beneficial for him going forward, especially as he tries to stretch out to a mile and a quarter. But it wasn't just about him. It was more about his sire on Saturday and everything that Gunrunner is doing. And there's just there, there are no more superlatives, really, that I think we can we can come with, come, come up with to describe Gunrunner and his immense success, immense early success as a stallion, because 
He had both grade one winners on Saturday at Parks. He had Taba. He had Society, who ran away with a wire-to-wire win. And the Cotillion looked very good in that race. And she's starting to come into her own a little bit. But he had multiple winners at Church, multiple stakes winners at Churchill, too. He had Gunite and the Harrods Creek Stakes. He had Echo Zulu came back and showed her top form in the Dogwood Stakes. And he also had 63 Caliber, who won the Seneca Overnight Stakes on Saturday at Churchill Downs, I can't remember a stallion having five major stakes winners on one day. And it's just remarkable because these are still his first books. You know, it, he wasn't necessarily getting the kind of mares that he's going to get now. He's going to get the, the the cream of the crop in terms of mares, you know, even over some other, you know, superstar stallions, especially if some of them start to age. Gunrunner is going to be getting the first call for a lot of breeders. So I'm just curious about what you guys think. Have you ever seen a stallion get off to this quick of a start, you know, and have so much success in his first couple of books. Well, I, I mean, Joe, no, I mean, this is, I mean, he's only in his second, the, the, the two year olds are his second crop and it's not too early. And, you know, we get caught up in hyperbole and hype a little bit, but it's not too early to say he's one of the greatest stallions of all time, because this is only going to continue. And he's a young horse. I mean, if he's doing, you know, he's going to be around as a stallion for what? another 15, 16 years, imagine what he's going to be able to accomplish throughout the the longevity of his career. And, you know, there's nothing fluky about this. I mean, in, in horse racing, nobody comes up with statistics like this, but I would love to know if a horse has ever had five stakes winners on one day, probably not. And that's talking about all the great stallions that have gone through, you know, the sport, you know, going back to the horses like Bold Ruler and things like that, you know, in a bygone era. Um, you know, again, you it's like when we talk about flight line, just you run out of superlatives what to say about him as a racehorse. It's the same thing with Gunrunner. You know, you're running out of superlatives what to say for him as, as a sire. I, I mean, those numbers are just absolutely unbelievable. It's not just the five. It's every category you want to look at, every single category so far as stakes runners, number of winners, et cetera. I mean, he is a superstar, a super duper star as a sire. I mean, you just look at the numbers and we've seen brilliant racehorses like, like Tappet was an okay racehorse. He's a fantastic sire, but it's very rare that we find a champion, a horse of the year, a Breeders' Cup winner, who was a two-year-old winner, who sired 31 first crop winners, who sired five stakes winners. It's rare to have the whole package. Like, has there ever been a horse of the year that started out their first season like this? I don't think there has. We got into mischief. He wasn't horse of the year. You know, there's numerous horses that have not had such an incredible year. You talk about great race mares not being able to reproduce themselves. So often great race horses cannot reproduce themselves. And I think Gunrunner seemingly has it all. Like he's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And it's, you know, a lot of people have made this point, but he was not really an early type. He was, he was a little bit of a later developing horse. So it's scary to imagine what his horses are going to be like as they get to race beyond the three-year-old year, which we obviously haven't seen yet. This is his first crop that's doing what it's doing as three-year-olds right now. So imagine if these horses can get even better as four-year-olds and five-year-olds. And like I said, factor in that he's now going to be getting the top of the top mares. Not that he was, not that he was an under the radar stallion ever, even at the beginning, but he wasn't this. Nobody has been this, this soon. So it's going to be, I mean, I don't even, the sky is the sky, the the space is the limit. Like how far can we go another galaxy like for Gunrunner? Because he's, he's going to, he's going to shatter all those ceilings. It seems. Well, Joe, let's talk about his other grade one winner on Saturday, which was society in the cotillion. I handicapped that race and I looked at her and she had that one huge figure last time out at Charlestown. It's like, yeah, right. Charlestown, this race is around five turns or whatever. (laughs) And you know, it's just, I thought it was completely fluky and boy, was I wrong. And I thought she was, ultra impressive in there. And I I love horses who have this running style. They get out of the gate, they go fast and they run hard and they just run the competition off their feet. It's like, I'm going to go out fast and there's nothing you can do about it. And I'm just going to beat you every step of the way. She was really, really good. Now, can she duplicate that in the Breeders' Cup Distaff against much tougher horses among them nest? I don't know if she can or not, but she's, I think she's a serious player in this division now. Uh, you know, her, and again, the cotillion liked the Pennsylvania Derby. They didn't have nest, but had secret oath. It was a really strong field. And she was a winner of that race 
every single step of the way. I mean, maybe you thought, okay, she's going to quit after six furlongs or something like that, quit after four furlongs. No, she was strong every step of the way. It was a really smart ride by Giroux. I love when jockeys are aggressive like that. They just go out and say, I'm on the best horse. I'm going to go out and run these horses off their feet. She's another gun runner who has picked up a grade one winner uh, and is going to be someone to uh, you know keep an eye on. As, as a, I was equally impressed with her in her race as I was with Taba. I really thought she was very, very good. And look out, Nest. Maybe she's got some competition coming down the block for her as well, assuming that the Phillies will come back next year at four because most good Phillies do. Yeah, and she's very, very good. But I think a lot of people are going to take from that race, oh, well, it was a speed-favoring racetrack and this, this and that. Like nobody was touching her that day and she was tremendous and she really did up her game. And the one thing about Steve Asmussen being the trainer is – if you look at his good horses, he just prides himself in managing to keep them on the same level. She's reached that grade one plateau. And Steve has a unique knack, if you look at his good horses over the year, of keeping them there for as long as possible. And then when they're done, they're, they're basically, they're done. They've done their bit. But I can see this filly now that she's reached that grade one plateau, just, just carrying on. Well, and I liked her in that race, too, because I thought there wasn't a lot of speed on paper. So I was like, you know, she'll be able to set moderate fractions. So much for the moderate fraction. She blitzed through like 46 and change, but really just kept going. So I felt smart, even though I was technically wrong. You know, I love those. I love those opinions where I was like, yeah, it'll be a slow pace. Wasn't a slow pace. Didn't matter. Still catch the ticket. But so <laughs> there's a little bit, a little bit of drama on the park's backstretch. It wasn't all about the racing this Saturday. Bill Finley has done some reporting on this. As the crackdowns continue in Pennsylvania on potential cheaters, we're going to talk more about that after this break. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The Keeneland September sale ended, ended its record run on Saturday with gross sales of four hundred five million four hundred ninety five thousand and seven hundred dollars. And three cents. No, just kidding. The highest in Keeneland auction history. It also set records with an all time high average of $142,429 and a median of $70,000. So, records across the board, which is hard to do because of the standard that Keeneland September has set over the years. And here's some stats that represent the diversity of the buying bench 88 different buyers each spent a million dollars or more. 88. 30 yearlings sold for a million dollars or more. The top 10 highest priced horses sold to eight different buyers and demand for horses produced a record clearance rate of 82%. Shout out to Katie for all those stats. It was a remarkable, remarkable sale. Obviously just watching it, when you see it all boiled down like that, it really is staggering. So congrats to everybody at Keeneland on an immensely successful sale. And we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there is one place you need to be. The place where history comes alive with every championship victory. He's off the dick and deep. The place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel. The place that exists to be the heart of this industry. The center of it all. Home to the November breeding stock sale and 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. He was just put together like a machine, and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law, pops the cork in the champagne. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law. Tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Ashford Sire Munnings had a huge weekend on Saturday. His son Scaramouche got his third straight victory in the Grade 2 Gallant Bob Stakes at Parks. Then Kamari, very impressive, got her second straight Grade 2 win in the Gallant Bloom, became the newest millionaire for Munnings. Her next start will be in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. She got a big figure for that race, too, I think. And she's got to be one of the top choices in the Philly and Mare Sprint, especially now that John's best friend, Gamine, has been retired. Munnings already has 13 stakes winners this year, which is second only to, into mischief. So he just keeps chugging along and producing top-class horses. Not to be forgotten, at Churchill last week, Moe's Treasure became the latest winner for his sire, Uncle Mo, or rather for Motown, son of Uncle Mo, who is now the sire of nine winners in his first crop and stands at Ashford for $7,500. 
this was a big news on Saturday. It didn't quite overshadow the news on the racetrack because the performance was, was so good. But Bill Finley tweeted this during the day, got a lot of traction that there was a there was a raid of not a raid, but there, there were a lot of people, there were a lot of security checkpoints checking, you know, cars and, and trucks and vans that were coming into the track and discovered supposedly some contraband. Bill, why don't you tell us more? Yeah, well, we've talked about this before, Joe. I mean, the Pennsylvania Racing Commission, I would have told you two years ago, was the worst racing commission in the country. They didn't care. They didn't do anything. I don't know what's gotten lit in a fire in there, but they are kicking ass and taking names. And we've talked about a lot of stuff that they've done. On Saturday, I was getting more texts out of parks about the raids and they got this guy and they busted this guy. Then people were talking about Taba uh, and and society in there. So um, what happened and and the details didn't really come out until yesterday and earlier this morning. I, I knew the names, but I couldn't, I, I wasn't afraid to go out and, and mention them without a hundred percent confirmation. But what happened was at parks over the, the Friday before the Pennsylvania Derby, uh, they con- conducted some backstretch raids and they also checked cars going in and out of the backstretch. That's something they've done in the past. Remember, they had uh, did uh, out of competition testing. They caught a trainer with clombuterol. They did a backstretch um, search of, of that barn. They did uh, the, the searches of the, um, the the people coming in and out of the backstretch last year, caught a trainer. It's not parks. It's the Pennsylvania Racing Commission. And what they found was they found two trainers one by the name of Miguel Penaloza and another one by the name of Cesar Marquez. Both were in possession of needles and syringes. And they found a jockey by the name of Edwin Rivera in possession of a battery. I, I've got a lot of thoughts about this, but I want to throw it to you guys. But the one thing that I wanted to say, one of the things that's most amazing about this is you'd say the trainers, okay, they, they caught two guys that are winning 30%, right? They, they caught you know the guys that we think are the bad guys that are juicing all the time. This guy, Marquez, is a 4% trainer, and he was cheating or allegedly cheating. Thank you. What does that say about what the heck is going on in the backstretch? And the other guy, Penaloza, was a 12 or 13% trainer, something like that. So that was one of the things that, that struck me when I said, really, these guys? These are the guys that are getting caught. Um, you know, so that's one of the many thoughts I have about it. But yeah, you know, you know, fortunately, it didn't overshadow the Pennsylvania Derby. That would have been unfair. But here we go again, you know, on, on what is a supposed to be a really special weekend at Parks. And it was because the racing was great. You still have this sordid story that, you know, just is, you know, this just goes on and on and on in horse racing. But I will say this about the Pennsylvania Racing Commission you know, good on them. You know, here's a racing commission that is not afraid of bad headlines for the sport and is clearly trying to do something to clean up a situation that needs to be cleaned up. Basically, that's that's all I can simply say. Good for them. It's the biggest weekend of racing. They started on the 19th. They caught these guys the day before the Pennsylvania Derby. If anything, it's a big thumbs up that they got these guys. And these guys are so stupid. I mean, (laughs) I heard word on the 20th that they were going in there. Now, backstretch talk goes very, very quickly. Bad news travels fast. So there's whispers. And usually where there's smoke, there's fire. These guys are so stupid that they didn't realize on the biggest weekend of racing at parks that something may be getting done. Like, so so good for parks and good for them because many years ago, and actually not too many years ago, what happened at parks generally stayed at parks. So kudos to the Racing Commission and everybody there for trying to clean up this sport. Every single little bit counts. Like, well done. Yeah. And well, and why this should be happening everywhere, everywhere, every, you know, as as much as humanly possible, this kind of surveillance should should be happening everywhere because that's the easiest way, relatively speaking, to catch cheaters. And like Bill was saying, I think that the story here is the Pennsylvania Racing Commission and the powers that be of Pennsylvania taking this seriously, finally, and being willing to sacrifice some bad headlines in the short term for getting the, the, the dirty stuff out of the sport in the long term. And I think that that's, you know, I think back to the the uh, FBI indictments that dropped you know, almost two and a half, you know, a year and a half ago now. And well, two and a half just, years, Joe. Was it? It was 2020. Yeah, March, yeah, it was 2020 yeah. Wow. Time flies. Yeah. Oh, a lot of episodes of the show. Um, but yeah, like that was that that was a day where I knew that there were going to be a lot of really nasty headlines and, and articles written about that. But I was happy because now we're finally taking out the trash. And that's what needs to happen. It's like you can't just let these guys slide and then hope that it doesn't bubble up and become a public story at some point. 
You have to stop these problems at the root and you have to stop them before they're able to cheat and to juice horses, allegedly. And I think I thought the battery thing was really interesting, too, like because it's not it wasn't just the trainers. It was a jockey who was allegedly in, in possession of a battery, which is the kind of thing that should be a lifetime ban in racing. And I think, you know, you can feel two ways about it. You can feel grossed out that this stuff is still going on, but you can also feel happy and enthused that there are some people and some cops on the beat now who are willing to take a stand and willing to, to crack some skulls and do something to stop the problem. Because that's been our biggest lament, I think, throughout this show. You know, when when guys would pop, when sh- no, known cheaters would pop up at different tracks and just get chance after chance after chance. And it just felt like you're just shouting into the wind and that nobody is actually stepping up to do something about it. Now, at least it seems in Pennsylvania, there are people that are doing something about it. And honestly, I think that not to not to give us too much credit, I think this show has helped, and I think a lot of a lot of racing Twitter has helped because it has been an accountability, an raised level of accountability in racing the last couple of years, especially since the Santa Anita deaths and the FBI indictments. To where now I think that people in racing have finally gotten the message that we need to be proactive about this stuff. We can't wait until this stuff leaks and becomes a giant national story because then we all have egg on our faces. This is the way to root out the evil in this sport, and I, you know, I'm, I'm with Zoe. Applause to the Pennsylvania Racing Commission and the people at parks who were not scared of the negative headlines and instead just did the right thing. Joe, a lot of points here. I want to, yeah, talk about uh, several different things. Um, You're absolutely right about this. If the Pennsylvania Racing Commission can do this, why can't everybody? And when's the last time you heard about the New York Gaming Commission doing anything so far as a barn search or out of competition testing? I mean, they're Unless they, they've done stuff and they haven't told anybody about it, and I, I don't understand why that would be. Um, you, you know, there's a lot of racing commissions out there that do absolutely nothing. And they sit back and they think that they can catch people and they can police the game through standard drug testing. It's been proven over the years from the days of the, the, you know, the beginning of the time with Oscar Barrera was winning, you know, improving horses, 50 buyer points. If there were buyer points back then, running them back three days after he claimed them for 12,500. Um, you know, the standard drug testing doesn't catch anybody with anything other than overages of therapeutic medications. Yes, you have to do it, but it's not going to catch anybody. So number one, like you said, why can't other racing commissions do this? Number two, it's also interesting. And we didn't mention they did the same searches and raids at parks and Presque Isle as well. Apparently they came up with nothing there. So, you know, I guess that shines a good light on those racetracks that they couldn't find anything there. And I also wonder where HISA fits in in this and, you know, what is going to happen when they take over? I assume that the Pennsylvania Racing Commissions of the world will succeed this uh, role to HISA. I got to tell you something, if I'm Lisa Lazarus, I called the Pennsylvania Racing Commission and said, well, you guys are doing a better job than we ever could. Yes. We're going to let it, we're going to worry about the other 49 states. You guys keep kicking some butt uh, there in Pennsylvania. But um, uh, again, it, it's uh, it's just it's an astounding story, but it's not an astounding story because, you know, you just know that this stuff is going on. You just don't know the extent of it. And I still can't get over the fact that a 4% trainer was apparently cheating. He must have been the worst cheater in the world. How bad would he have been if he wasn't cheating? <laughs> Allegedly when cheating. I, when I read those stats, that's exactly my thought. I'm like, how bad is this guy? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what was in those syringes, but whatever it was, I don't know. Like, how bad was he? Obviously not maybe very was, smart. Yeah, I don't know, maybe he had nothing in there, but, you know, vitamin C or something. Who knows? No, but I mean, Bill brings up a good point about, you know, whether or not when the HISA drug enforcement uh, program you know, allegedly potentially goes into effect January 1st, 2023, we'll see if it actually happens. Will they cede at all to these racing commissions who are doing a good job? Because it's, it's going to be a massive, massive undertaking to oversee all of the drug enforcement for the entire sport. And I think they would be smart to form partnerships with partners who are actually doing the right thing. I think there are a lot of people that they should, you know, kick the hell out of racing commissions and say, we're, we're taking charge and, and we're going to be in, in charge of the drug enforcement. But if Pennsylvania Racing Commission and, and the people who run these tracks are doing the job, just work hand in hand with them. I think that's the way to go. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Association and the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders. Kentucky Bred swept the grade ones. I think this is... 
this is like a recording. They should just play me saying Kentucky bred swept the grade ones every single week. They swept the grade ones at parks on Saturday with Taba winning the grade one Pennsylvania Derby and society taking the grade one Cotillion stakes. You can find your Kentucky bread at the OBS October sale, October 11th through 12th and the face of Tipton, Kentucky, October yearling sale, October 24th through the 27th. We'll be right back after this message from the KTOB. With some of the fullest fields in the country, quality racing year round. There's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Brats, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. Accelerate, a five-time grade one winner with over six million in earnings. In 2018 alone, he won the Santa Anita Handicap, the Gold Cup, the Pacific Classic by a record-setting 12 and a half lengths, the Awesome Again, and bested a world-class field in the Breeders' Cup Classic. A grandson of legendary Lanes and Stallion Smart Strike, Accelerate stands to continue his grandsire's legacy at Lanes End. TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Lane's End. This week's Lane's End Stallion of the Week is The Factor. The son of Warfront's top performers include grade one winners Cistron and Noted and Quoted, along with graded stakes winners Bound for Nowhere and Factor This. He's a top 20 general active North American sire. He stands for $17,500, the star-studded roster at Lane's End. Earlier, we spoke to Jimmy George, who's the Tattersall's director. Usually we don't have international, you know, I think because Zoe's on, we had to bring in a fellow British person, you know, just to make her feel, just to make her feel at home on our first episode. But no, we talked to Tattersall's director, Jimmy George, who's a, who's a really smart guy and who's getting prepared for the Tattersall's October yearling sale, which if you're an American centric guy like me, you need me to draw the parallel is like the Keelan September sale. In, in Europe, it's obviously it's a it's a great opportunity for buyers. We've seen more American participation over the years. We had a great conversation with Jimmy. Check it out. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Dot com. So we are thrilled to welcome on. We've been wanting to have this guy on for a while. Tattersall's director, Jimmy George. Thanks for coming on. Good to be here, guys. Yeah, great to join you. Great to have you. Obviously, the Tattersall's October sale is coming up. Premier yearling sale in Europe. I uh, wanted to ask about the American participation, the increasing American participation at that sale, because that's something we've seen in the opposite direction. We've seen international participation here at Keeneland September and up some other sales. What has that meant to the Tattersall sale to have more and more participation from across the pond? Yeah, look, it's had a huge impact on book one in particular of the October yearling sale at Tattersall's. In the last sort of five, six years, really, it, it started sort of with a little bit of a, a trickle, may not be quite the right word. It was the, the sort of Chad Brown, Mike and Mary Ryan, Peter Brandt, Seth Klarman and Axis, and, and they came a few years back with a bit of a plan. They bought a dozen yearlings, and uh, at least two of them turned out to be grade one winners, possibly even three. My memory's getting so bad these days. But when you get off to a start like that, it sort of encourages you to come back bigger and better. And uh, those guys came back, and they were followed by some others like sort of Liz Crow and Bradley Wiseboard, who went home with Aunt Pearl. So, you know, every time these guys come, they go home with some really smart horses, and that encourages more people to come and, and makes my job easy. Jimmy, uh, thanks for joining us. You sort of touched on my next question, but I mean, the number of Tattersall's grads that have won big races in the U.S. this year is just, it, the list goes on. Uh, you mentioned Aunt Pearl, you've got McCulloch, you have Ocean Road, um, you have technical analysis, Campanelle. Uh, is this, how is this affecting the sale? Are people now, is this open people's eyes to what they can acquire by going over to your sale and going overseas? I think it has, Bill. I, th I think it's really made them realise that, and, and with no disrespect to anybody else's um, breeding programmes, as it were, or the strength and depth of their own breeding operations, the best turf stallions are standing in Europe, really, and uh, or the, the best ones that are readily accessible. We Maybe Japan is a little bit of an outlier in that respect, but, uh, you know, the most easily accessible 
top class turf yearlings in the world are to be found in Europe and the best of the best are at book one of the October yearling sale. And I think, yeah, the success the guys had from the word go did exactly that. It opened people's eyes. It made them realise that uh, it, it wasn't just the Galileo show. You know, there was Dubawi and Frankel ready to step into his shoes. You've got Kingman, you've got Lope de Vega, you've got See the Stars, and obviously the sire of Baid this year and a superstar stallion in his own right. The Kodiaks and Dark Angels of this world. The depth of these sires at the moment in Britain, Ireland and France is possibly unprecedented. And combine that with some fantastic broodmare bands in the commercial breeders' hands, and you've got a pretty compelling mix of but one of the October yearling sale. Jimmy Zoe here, really, really looking forward to the October sale. And I, I have a lot of friends that recently got on planes to Orby and Goffs, and now they're coming over to England. And the thing they've really been buoyed about is the exchange rate. You're basically trading dollars for pounds. I mean, you guys have to be rubbing your hands together with the Americans coming over with fistfuls of cash. Yeah, so it's it's not quite buy one, get one free, but it's very near. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, it, it, the, the, the weakness of the pound, it's, it's a little bit alarming in some senses to anybody who actually lives here. But for anybody trading in, in US dollars, we are... You know, they will come to book one of the October yearling sale next week and be buying the same quality of horse for 20, 25 percent less than they were paying last year. That is a massive discount. I mean, this is, you know, this is an unprecedented opportunity for anybody who wants to race turf horses of the highest quality in North America. Because I look, I'm, I'm knocking on a bit now and and the 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 dollar is stronger than it ever has been against the pound in my lifetime or the lifetime of anybody on this program tonight. So I, all I can say is, you know, take advantage. It probably won't be like this for a very long time. At least I, I, I guess I hope not from the UK perspective, but it is, yeah, it's a huge factor. And and it's not just against the US dollar that the pound is weak. It's It's weak against an awful lot of other international currencies. And I'm sure that won't go unnoticed. You know, we're having a, a real resurgence of the yearling stale market going on right here in the U.S. Came on September, smashed records. Earlier in the year, the Phase 6 Saratoga sales smashed records. I think a lot of people are attributing that to the fact that everyone's back. And you guys had to adapt during COVID, had a lot of more online bidding options. Can you talk about how Tattersalls has navigated the pandemic and whether or not you feel that same vibe of excitement that, that everybody can come and be part of the sale in person? Yeah, I think that. All of our, all of the sales companies have um, hugely enjoyed. Well, look, the whole world's enjoyed moving on from the COVID pandemic. Uh, that that goes without saying. But why are we still on Zoom? Why are we still <laughs> exactly, I, mean, I should be with you guys. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> but to have people back at the sales grounds in the numbers they have all throughout this year at Tadasols and clearly everywhere else, and certainly in the Northern Hemisphere. Well. Look, in Australia and New Zealand as well, they've had hugely vibrant sales. It's wonderful. It's great to see. There's clearly an appetite. Um, you sort of get the impression maybe a little bit of pent-up enthusiasm after the, the two grisly years of COVID. You know, there are economic challenges out there, make no mistake, but the demand for quality thoroughbreds has possibly surprised a lot of us. And uh, long may it last. And, you know, we have challenges other than, you know, economic in, in, in British and Irish racing in terms of prize money. It's not quite at the levels it, that we'd like it to be or, or, or where yours is um, or certainly other, other parts of the world. But there is a massive enthusiasm for our wonderful sport. And I think we're seeing that in sales rings at Tattersalls and, and, and throughout the world. Jimmy, in addition to the pound versus dollar and the currency exchange, I've had people that have shopped at Tattersalls tell me it's you don't have to spend as much to get a really good horse. And, you know, in this day and age, when Chad Brown goes over and spends 200,000 pounds or so on some of these horses, well, the 200,000 pounds is a lot of money. But when you compare it to Keeneland, where people are spending a million, million five to get the very top end horses, are these people right? Is it easier to find a good horse? For less money at Tattersalls than it might be at the U.S. sales. I think they have honed in on a on a sector of the market that they're very very comfortable at, and they they've come with a plan and and a budget that works incredibly well at book one of the October yearling sale. 
the the very top of our market, I think, has always been extremely robust and and you know dominated by some some obvious superpowers that have been with us all and with with, with the sport globally for a very long time. And they're um, you know they they're, they're pretty dominant at times. They're they're joined um, by plenty of others over the years. But you know the the, the Mactoon family and the Coolmore Axis they 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 have dominated the top of the European market, the global yearling market in many respects for a long, long time. But I think what's key for the American buyers is they have found a comfort zone in and around, as you say, Bill, that 200 to 400,000 guinea mark, which in a normal year, it's, that's two to $400,000 this year, but but in a normal year would have been $250, $300 to six six fifty dollars somewhere around that mark. And they have been hugely successful, and yeah, if they're finding value in that sector of the market compared with in their in their own backyard, that's great for us because you know they're they're adding depth to our market in that sector. And as you say, it's extraordinary what they have gone home with in in that price bracket. You know, newspaper a record of uh, if I remember correctly was two hundred thousand. McCulloch this year one hundred and eighty thousand guineas. In Italian, a little bit of an outlier. She was she was actually over four hundred thousand guineas, but Campanelli was under two hundred thousand guineas. You know, it's remarkable what these guys are finding in that. For you know, as you say, Bill, it is a lot of money, but in in relative terms, for the quality they're finding consistently, it's really good value, and and they they yeah they they're comfortable there and they're successful. Jimmy, talk to us about the kind of horses you think that the American clientele are after, because I mean, I briefly zipped through the catalog, and hip number one is a filly by Galileo, who's a half sister to a Breeders' Cup horse in line of duty. Do you think this is what the Americans are seeking, or is there other value a little bit further deeper in the catalog and say books three, two and three as well? Yeah, so it, it, it's quite nice to start up any any elite yearling sale with a Galileo half-sister to a Breeders' Cup winner. It really is. And it, it sets the tone for, for book one, which, I, look, I, I sound like a broken record, but it is Europe's premier yearling sale. These are the best turf yearlings out there. But, yeah, I mean, look, book two is, to a degree, slightly um, – it hasn't been mined quite as deeply by the U.S. buyers to date – we would love there will be some that will stay on through to book two, I think, this year, and they will find some very, very smart yearlings there as well. Honestly speaking, I think, you know, if, if you're you're aiming for the very top for the, the future grade one winners, you are probably best advised starting in what purports to be the premier yearling sale of its type. Same at Keeneland with book one there or same at Inglis for the Easter yearling sale, something like that. So, you know, you start at the top and work your way down. This year's Derby winner, Desert Crown, he's an unbeaten Derby winner and, and a, an absolutely outstanding one, I think, even though we haven't seen him since. But, uh, yeah, he came from book two. He cost 280,000 guineas, so he was at the top end of that market. But he came from book two. And even this weekend, we had two, um, two, uh, one definitely grade one winner, group one winner, obviously, as we call them, and I think group two winner came from book three. So look, the quality permeates all the way through the the October yearling sale, and we've got the thick end of 2,000 of them. But for people traveling from as far away as, as North America or from Japan or Hong Kong or Australia, they're probably going to hone in on book one to start with and see how they go. And if there's money to be spent afterwards, there's plenty left. <laughs> Last question for me, Jimmy. You know, I know you're a sales guy, but you mentioned before about the increased purse money that is maybe being maybe a benefit to people like you who run sales. It's not quite as much as it is in, in North America, especially here in, in here and not here, but Kentucky has this exploding purse money that I think is really helping the sales market. Can you tell some of the listeners who may not be tuned in to European racing on a day to day basis? What that what the health of the racing side is like, because, you know, I've heard for a long time that it's a little bit polarized, like the purses at the top level are great, but on a day to day basis, it's a, it's a little bit tough to get by. So, so what, what is your analysis and your assessment of what that's like right now? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Joe. It, it's our prize money is competitive when you get to the graded stakes level. 
make no mistake. Okay, look, it's not it's not in the same stratosphere as Japan or you know the the upper the upper levels in Hong Kong or something like that. But they are outliers. But it's fair to say that, or it's not fair. It's true to say that the most valuable race run in Europe or North America in the last three months was in England. So that was the King George at one and a quarter million. It wasn't at Saratoga, it wasn't at Del Mar, it wasn't anywhere else in North America or anywhere else in Europe. It was in England. That, you know, yeah, of course we'd like some more money in some of our graded stakes group races and, and our listed races as well. But the real issue is at maiden level or just above that. You know, the entry level prize money is poor. There's no dressing it up. You know, I'm I, I'd be you, you know, I'd be taking trying to take people for fools if I pretended otherwise. It is poor. So that's the area we need attention from the powers that be. That's where we need an injection of, of money. I mean, from the Tadassol's perspective, we introduced what we imaginatively called the Book One Bonus Scheme a few years ago for Book One yearlings, where we, we give £20,000 extra in prize money to any British or Irish winner of a maiden or, or novice race there, but they're effectively maidens uh, of a certain level. And that has been, as you can imagine, when you're normally competing for somewhere between three and a half and five and a half thousand pounds in win prize money when you win your maiden, if you lob in an extra 20, that makes a massive difference. And near as damn it means that that person has paid their training fees for a year with their maiden win. So that's that's our stance. We we truly believe that that's where prize money should be heading in this country. And uh, look, and the powers that be, I'm sure, share that view. They just haven't come up with the answer and uh, fervently hope they do pretty soon, because obviously the sport, you know, in, in, in its wider sense will will benefit enormously. Uh, Jimmy, one of the interesting things about any yearling sale is how the first crop stallions are going to do. Can you give us uh, some of the names of the new faces, uh, new kids on the block, and who are people getting excited about? Yeah, I, I hate it when people ask that question, <laughs> Bill, because <laughs> my aging sludge-like brain needs to a little, who are the first season sires? What are we? Oh, God. You know, but, um, so I'm going to have to take my little my, my little crib sheet, which okay. is the catalog here, and uh and immediately I get to Blue Point, who is, um, you know, young son of Shamadal. So his first crop of yearlings, he's he's an exciting young sire. He he really is. We've got a fair few of those. Forgive me as I take my as I take my crib sheet here. But um the um they they've been pretty well received so far. You've got we've got a couple by Land Force who's a um who's a, a young horse. Well, obviously he's got his first crop. And uh, yeah, he's a half brother to a filly called Photo Call who won the Rodeo Drive a few years ago in in the states. It'd be interesting to see how they're received. Magna Grecia, obviously the Guineas winner, um, Invincible Spirit horse. The the early signs have been have been that they're, they're going to be very well received. And Massar, the, the the Derby winner of a few years back, he's got his sort of it feels like a slightly belated first crop, but again they've been well received. If if we were to Put, put my finger, I mean, it's always dangerous when you work for a sales company to highlight any particular stallion. But um, I guess, you know, Study of Man's very interesting as a son of Deep Impact, won the French Derby. Uh, Saxon Warrior, obviously, another son of Deep Impact. He's getting off to a good start over here at the moment with his first crop of two-year-olds. And there seems to be a bit of buzz about Too Darn Hot, um, who obviously was a very, very good two-year-old in his own right, and then went on to be, uh, you know, obviously a Group One winning three-year-old as well. Very, very well-bred horse, um, son of Dubawi, and and that says it all at the moment because there's so many young sons of Dubawi that are uh, doing incredibly well. Some of whom have started from relatively humble origins and have worked their way up. So there's there's quite a lot of excitement about him too. So we've got yeah we've got some nice young sires coming through to go with go with the. Uh, the uber sires that are well established by now. Is it a little bittersweet to get to the end of Galileo? Because you still have a bunch catalogue, but it's almost like the end of an era. Yeah, it's, I mean, 
how do you replace the irreplaceable? He's he's just a uh, you know he, he he's a once in a lifetime sire, or certainly once in my lifetime. Um, but we've got sixteen very smart Galileo yearlings in in book one this year, and uh, I'd expect them to be very eagerly sought after. But I think it is a reflection of the quality of the stallions that have come through in in his in his wake that. We've almost not taken a beat. You know, it's Galileo is gone, but there's Frankel and there's Dubawi and there's Kingman and there's See the Stars and there's, you know, these are extraordinary stallions in their own right. So to be able to to move on from arguably the best stallion of, of, of my lifetime and certainly standing in standing in Europe with to, to move on to horses of the caliber of Frankel, Dubawi, and see the stars and and, and Kingman is 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 extraordinary. And uh, we're very, very lucky. I mean, Frankel achieved 100, uh, I think it's group and listed winners, so not just not not group winners in, in, in double quick time. As quick, I think he equaled actually Dane Hill um, in terms of the quickest stallion ever to achieve that milestone. But let's not forget that Dane Hill was standing in two hemispheres. <laughs> you know, this horse has only ever and only ever will stand in the northern hemisphere. And he reached that milestone in the same time that Dane Hill did. It's, it's quite bizarre. Um, you know, so we're very lucky. And, and again, I think that the, the U.S. buyers that are coming over here, they've readily identified that. And obviously McCulloch is flying the flag for Frankel and book one at the very highest level in, um, you know, in, in, in the States this year. This year, And I, I hope that they'll go home with a few more of them. Absolutely. We expect the participation to be robust. Tattersall's October yearling sale runs from October 4th through October 15th. Starts with a three-day book one, October 4th through the 6th. Definitely get involved. Jimmy George, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. I'd, I'd love to do it again if you'll have me. Thank Absolutely. you, Jimmy. Great to talk to you. Thanks, Jimmy. Great. Thanks, Jimmy. All the best. Thanks, guys. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Jimmy George, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week features Brand, who went four furlongs in 48 flat on Friday at Santa Anita. John Sadler trainee was last seen taking the grade two turf sprint stakes at Kentucky Downs, which is a win in your end for the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. You can see that work on the screen right now. Definitely low key contender for the turf sprint. I never, never throw out those California turf sprinters. And we have a Californian and an XBTV worker here. It's Zoe Cadman. Can you talk a little bit about XBTV and the work you guys do? Yeah, basically, as you can see on the screen, this is brand working and we try and catch probably the best of the rest each and every week. And it's just a very unique tool that I have a lot of friends that are gamblers that that look at, because if you know what you're looking at, it's it's huge. And the beauty about XBTV is you can see Bran on the screen now, but you can also go back to six months ago and see how we looked then, which is a very unique tool you're not going to find anywhere else, especially with first time starters. You can see how they look leading up to the race, how they looked six months ago. You can go back and look at Justify before he ever ran if you really, really want to. So it really is a unique tool. 
It's free, which still boggles me each and every day. You just have to sign up at expressbet.com and just get an account. doesn't cost you any money. And just go there. You can search for pretty much every horse. We don't have every horse on there, but I spent all summer in Saratoga getting an awful lot of maidens that won first time out and courtesy of XBTV. It's a unique tool. It's a, it's a great, great resource, as I say, week after week. And yeah, get involved before they realize they can start charging for that content. Yeah, right? <laughs> This week's weekend preview, as always, is sponsored by Three Chimneys. I felt like we did a Three Chimneys commercial earlier in the show, but we were just talking about Gunrunner and how great he is. So I guess there's probably a little bit more of that coming up. We have a huge weekend. This is this and next weekend are the last two major prep re- weekends for the Breeders' Cup. It kind of reminds me of like late March, early April, when you have all those derby, derby preps coming together. So we have 12 Breeders' Cup winning your in races, big weekends at uh, Aqueduct and Churchill, especially. We also have the Ark this weekend, and we're going to talk about that as after we come f- oh, back from the break. Uh, but at Belmont this weekend, we have the Champagne, which is a grade one, the Miss Grill, which is a grade two, the Woodward, which is a grade one, the Belmont Turf Sprint Championship, which is a grade three. And that's just Saturday. Sunday, we've got the grade one Frisette, the grade two Pilgrim Stakes, um, and the grade three facing Tipton Waya Stakes. At Santa Anita on Saturday, we've got the grade one Awesome Again. But let's start with Belmont. Uh, the, the Champagne and the Frisette, I think, are both going to be pretty interesting races. The Champagne, we've got, we, I think we're going to get a couple of the top horses from the Hopeful coming back in Forte and uh, Gulfport. Gulfport needs a little bit of a rebound as well. In the Woodward, we're going to see Life is Good. You know, he's obviously appointment viewing. Very unclear who's actually going to show up against him other than a Uriah St. Louis horse. But we're always, always interested in seeing him. Um, and then on Sunday, I think the Frisette is going to be a really interesting race. One horse I'm looking at. Uh, for that, which is a horse I made a rising star at the TDN, was the Great Maybe. It was a Cherie DeVoe horse by Upstart. She was an incredibly impressive winner first time out. So you know, I got American Rocket, who I think is sneaky for Bill Mott. She was fourth in the in the spin away, but got off to a terrible, terrible start and came flying late. Chocolate Gelato was a nice horse for Todd Pletcher and Rapoli Stable. Also have some action at Churchill. Bill, what are you looking forward to on Saturday? Well, I guess I'm looking forward to life is good, but maybe not so much because he's running against tomato cans. Yes. Um, right now, it looks like there's going to be either a four or five horse field, including our friend Uriah St. Louis with informative. Uh, keep me in mind. Um, uh, let's see. I can't even read my scrib- scribbling handwriting there. So um, forget about that. But I mean, <laughs> we're looking possibly at a one to nine favorite in this race. And, the, you know, so I don't know what we're going to learn about him. And one thing that I want to learn about him is to still, I'm not convinced he wants a mile and a quarter, but what is this race going to tell you when he's running at a mile and eighth against, you know, basically horses that, you know, he's going to pull a flight line on and win by 19 and a quarter lengths. Uh, exactly. And one of the reasons why the field came up fairly weak is that I think there are people ducking him to go to the Lucas Classic, which is a $500,000 race at Churchill Downs. And this field came up, you know, it doesn't have life as good, but top to bottom, it's a much stronger race. You have Rich Strike trying to catch lightning in a bottle again on the track where he won the Kentucky Derby. First time he's going to take on older horses. Hot Rod Charlie, Happy Saver, and Art Collector among are among the field uh that is lining up for that race. So that'll be the better race of the two. But, you know, again, it, right now it's the battle to see who's going to be the second choice in the Breeders' Cup Classic. If Lightline wins the the Woodward, obviously he'll be the second choice in the wagering in the Classic, and most people will give him the best chance of any to beat Flightline. But we'll, we'll see. You know, again, I, I just... I, I don't know what Naira is supposed to do. They put up a big race and a big purse. And, and the, you know, if people are going to run away from life is good, you know, so be it. But I just don't know what we're going to find out about this horse or what he's going to prove. Uh, I mean, I would be shocked. I mean, I literally think he'll be one to nine in there. I mean, he's got to pay with the kind of field that he's lining up against. He's a horse that's going to pay 220 in that race. So I guess I'm looking more forward to the Lucas Classic because it's a deeper race with, you know, more competitive race. But, you know, again, I think sometimes we forget how good life is good is. If it weren't for flight line, take another drink. Um, he would be the horse we'd be raving about right now. The horse, the obvious horse of the year, et cetera. He's a really, really, really good horse. who just came around in a year with a horse that might be once in a lifetime. 
Yeah, and having watched Life is Good all summer at Saratoga, trains first thing in the morning. He's coming in with the ideal situation. They're shipping him straight from Saratoga. So he's not having to train at Belmont at Aqueduct or at Aqueduct because the training hours are all messed up down there at the moment while they redo Belmont Park. But he's just sensational. Um, there, there are not many horses that give you chills when you watch him work just as effortlessly as he gets over the track. He's simply amazing. And he's proven not to have to take his track with him. He's going to be coming in from Chile, Saratoga, where he's had ideal training conditions, less horses there to get him riled in. He's a good shipper. So, yes, I am really looking to, forward to life is good. As far as the Lucas Classic is, is I love Art Collector. I think he's a horse who's just coming in at the right time. Bill Mart has done a sensational job with him, just inch by inch getting him back to where he needs to be. And I think he most definitely is the horse to beat at Churchill on Saturday. Well, thank you, Zoe, for reminding me that it's Belmont at Aqueduct. I keep saying Belmont just because I'm so <laughs> used to these races being at Belmont. Belmont at Aqueduct. There's an Aqueduct guy. I should be remembering this, but I never do. So two turns in the Woodward, which maybe, maybe gives someone else a little bit of a chance more than if it were one turn. But, yeah, I don't think there's going to be show betting. I don't know if there's even going to be place betting in the Woodward because Bill's right. He's going he's gonna to be 1-9, to nine, if not 1-20 to 20 in that race. But. He is appointment viewing. He's great to watch. And like Zoe says, he's just, he, he gives you chills, you know, training, racing, all of it. He just is the second best horse in the country right now. And he's an unlucky, it was an unlucky crop year uh, for him, but he's, he's definitely one to watch. Um, so yeah, after this break, we're going to talk a tiny bit about the arc and then we're going to talk about the, the rest of the races to look forward to, including the grade one awesome again at Santa Anita. But the weekend preview is brought to you by Three Chimneys. It was an incredible day on Saturday for Gunrunner with five stakes winners, Taba and Society, plus Echo Zulu, Gunite, 63 caliber, Gunrunner's grade one winning son, Cyberknife, not to be outdone, also ran third in the Pennsylvania Derby and then run in son of a gun placed in the gallant Bob stakes. Also, fellow Three Chimneys sire Sharp Azteca will be represented on Saturday by Tyler's Tribe in the Iowa Cradle Stakes at Perry Meadows. Bill did a story about Tyler's My horse. Tribe. Love yeah. that horse. Yeah, he's, he's going to become the new mascot of the show um, <laughs> with Bill as the host because he's, you know, that, that it really is a super exciting horse. Um, so we'll be interested to see him run at Perry Meadows. And we've talked about his connections before. We'll be cheering for him as he looks for his fifth straight win. We'll be right back after this message from Three, Three Chimneys. Here comes Tabor. Tabor in the center of the track with good looking stride. Squares off with Cyberknife. Cyberknife takes the lead. Tabor going with him. These two in a thriller. Cyberknife just in front. And Cyberknife has won the TVG.com Haskell over Tabor. Jack Christopher finished third. The running time, 1 minute 46.24 seconds. Come, dream with us at Three Chimneys. I mentioned before the break, it's not just Belmont and Ch Belmont at Aqueduct, Joe. <laughs> Belmont at Aqueduct and Churchill this weekend. It's also Santa Anita. They got a couple of winning year-end races highlighted by the grade one. Awesome again, which they probably should rename the Flight Line also ran stakes because we have in that race Royal Ship, Express Train, Country Grammar. We had a couple other horses as well. Azul Coast, Tripoli, Slow Down Andy, who I teased last week as a potential Breeders' Cup mile horse, is now going to show up in the awesome again. Let's see what else we have at Santa Anita over the weekend. Um, that's a grade one uh, winning year in for the Breeders' Cup Classic. Also, the City of Hope Mile, which is a grade two, going a mile on the turf. Eddie D. Stakes, which will be down the hill, six and a half furlongs, grade two. Uh, John Henry Turf Championship, which is a mile and a quarter. It's also a grade two. And the Santa Anita Sprint Championship, which is a grade two. Uh, and then Sunday, we have four more stakes at Santa Anita including the grade three Chillingworth, the grade two Zenyatta Stakes, and the grade three Tokyo City Cup, none of which are winning your in races, but they do have a winning your in race. The Speakeasy Stakes, which will be two-year-olds going five furlongs on the turf. They're going to obviously be qualifying for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. But we also have the ARC this Sunday, and we would be remiss if we didn't get into that. It looks like it's going to be a gigantic field. I haven't seen any entries yet, uh, but just some of the horses that I recognize as a, you know, stupid American. The Denny, who was a very nice horse in France. Uh, Mishriff, who has obviously been a terrific horse for several years now. Torquator Tasso won the race at 80 to 1 or so last year. Alpinista, who's been a terrific filly this year, and just it looks like the top of her division. Uh, Westover, who's a nice horse, I believe is a group one winner. Um, but Zoe, come on, our, 
a resident European here. What do we have to look forward to in the arc and who are you, who are you honing in on? Well, I think we're going to have a little bit of drama leading into it because it will be a field of 20 for betting reasons in France with France Gallup. So there are going to be certain fillies that may not get in the race, which is going to cause some outcry because you've got the Melbourne Cup winner. She's sitting on the outside looking in right now and they may have to rethink. They're still trying to think maybe they're going to have more than 20 runners. Uh, Urban C won, there were 23 runners. You can go back to the 60s and there were 60 runners, 30 runners there. So th there's a lot going on right now, but for me, there is just one one filly that I love, and that is my old boss, Mark Prescott, Alpinista. She's not been beat since, I think, September 2020. She's ruled stake after grade one, after grade one, Luke Morris writes her. She doesn't have to take her ground with her. She's just a fantastic filly. Now, Luxembourg is going to be very, very tough to beat. But my money is going on Alpinista. And I'll say that right here, right now for my old boss, Samar. Hopefully he's listening, right? I don't know. What time is it right now? Uh, no, I mean, that's, no, that, she, she has been super impressive to me this year as well, even as a, as a novice uh, European racing viewer. But we appreciate that insight. And yeah. Uh, it usually runs all about like 10.30 or so Eastern time in the morning on Sundays, uh, 7.30 if you're on the West Coast. Uh, so, yeah, definitely set an alarm for that. And it's obviously the greatest race of the year in Europe. So we're looking forward to that. And we're hopefully going to maybe get to see a couple of the ARC horses come for the Breeders' Cup. I feel like that used to be a big thing and it's become less of a thing over the years. Um, but hopefully we'll get to see some of those horses come over to Keeneland for the Breeders' Cup as well. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtv.com. West Point was in the winner's circle on Saturday with Kadama, who got her second straight win at Delaware Park. West Point came out of the Keeneland September sale with a full roster of yearlings. Some of those still available for ownership include a City of Light filly, and a Constitution Colt going to John Sadler, and then a Matoli Philly, Nyquist Colt, and a Practical Joke Philly going to Christoph Clement. You can check it out on their website now, westpointtv.com, and click on Available Horses. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I wanna see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can, because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. It was a historic Keeneland September sale for Legacy Bloodstock. They had over $100 million in all-time sales and their highest ever Keeneland September sale average. They also had the highest priced yearlings by Distorted Humor, Bernardini, and four other stallions. Shout out to Tommy and Wendy. They do a terrific, terrific job. Still got a couple more yearling sales to go. Best of luck. This week's Remy cartoon has a little bit of fashion influence. We're, fa we're flashing forward to the Breeders' Cup and the Breeders' Cup red carpet. It's someone interviewing a jockey saying, so who are you wearing? And the jockey says, this outfit was designed by Claiborne Farms. Classic, classic racing fashion. All right, so as I mentioned earlier on the show and as I announced earlier today on Twitter, this is my final episode of The Writer's Room. I'm going to be moving on to trying to grow better things, doing a little bit more writing and a couple other creative ideas I have percolating in the old noggin. Uh, but there's so many people I want to thank. I, I, I thank the fans earlier on Twitter, and that's that goes tenfold for this show. Like They have just been the most terrific fans you could imagine. They really have kept me going throughout the last couple of years. But I want to thank 
also all the people that have made this show what it is and, and, and made me into the person and the, and the broadcaster I am. First off, got to thank Sue Finley and Patty Walt, Patty Wolf for starting this show. They're both visionaries and their, their success in their field speaks for itself. Their confidence in me and the show's concept really helped us hit the ground running to where we quickly, I think, you know, to pat ourselves on the back too much. We became the industry standard for what a racing news and analysis podcast could do. And, and Patty in particular has helped me grow so much as a host and she and her team have tirelessly worked to make this show by far the best looking and sounding podcast in the business and so much of it if it's success is because of that they truly did almost all of the heavy lifting we mainly had just had to show up and talk and then get all the credit so that was that we did we had the easy part uh anthony laraca alia laraca nathan wilkinson the rest of patty's editing team they're not only outstanding at what they do but they're great people through and through i've been proud to work with them every step of the way Katie Petruniak, our associate producer, is one of the most hardworking, genuine people in this business. And I think the absolute world of her. She and I have become close friends over the past six months or so, which I'm very grateful for. Can't wait to see all the awesome things that she does and she's going to do in racing because she's already super talented, but she's just scratching the surface of what she can do. Thank you to all the guests and the co-hosts up to and including the terrific Zoe Cadman, who I'm so excited to watch going forward on the show. Everybody's been so generous with their time and particularly the ones who lent their credibility to the show in its infancy. You know, I complain sometimes about certain things in racing, but one thing I've always appreciated is that is how willing everybody in racing is to talk. You know, that's been true in my writing. It's certainly been true on this show. Thank you to all the sponsors who have supported the show. And I especially want to thank three of our earliest foundational sponsors who helped us get going. The Green Group, West Point Thoroughbreds and Keeneland. And last but not least, as I started to get choked up a little bit, my road dogs, my homies, my partners in crime, and my older, older, older brothers who have been along for the ride on this show basically the whole way, Bill Finley and John Green. You guys have taught me so much about this game. Bill, you're the, one of the best in the world, if not the best in, world, in the world at what you do. John, you proved how valuable your voice is in this game as well. You both helped this show and turn into what it is with your fearlessness, your knowledge, your good humor. I'll continue to be a fan and a supporter of both of you guys. Thank you both from the bottom of my heart for all the laughs and the good times. Well, Joe, you made one huge mistake there. You gave credit to everybody but yourself. And uh, look, as, as people well know, let's call what's going to start next week um, Writer's Room 2.0. There's going to be Zoe's going to be part of the show. R Randy Moss is going to be part of the show. Uh, T.D. Thornton's going to help us out as well. And I will be taking over Joe's role uh, as the host of this. But can we be as good as the original TDN writers room? Well, we've got huge shoes to fill. And Joe, you're a big part of that reason why. I, I mean, your insights, your humor, your professionalism, your on-air presence, I can't say enough about that. You did an absolutely fantastic job as, as the lead man of this podcast, and it wouldn't be anywhere near what it has become if it weren't for you. You're going to be sorely missed. And again, I just hope that we can do this show proud as we move forward into a new era and live up to the reputation that we develop in large part because of what you have done and the work that you've put in on this. Thank you so much, brother. That means so much to me. I love you. I love all you guys who have ever worked on the show. It's been everything to me for the past couple of years. And let's quickly go to the goodbyes before I, I break down crying, because this is this has been hard for me. And, you know, I'm at peace with what I want to do. And, you know, it's bittersweet, but I'm so, so grateful. Gratitude above everything for me, everything that this show has brought me and all the relationships that I've made because of it. So thank you, Bill, and thank thank you everybody who's, who's helped me along the way on this show. So that's gonna do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. The Keeneland November sale, I think is coming up in a couple of months. I honestly can't go through the copy right now because I gotta get through these goodbyes. But I wanna thank Bill Finley, Zoe Cadman, our Green Group guest of the week, Jimmy George, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Leah LaRocca and Nathan Wilkinson. Stay safe down there with the hurricane, guys. Love you all so much. This has been the thrill of my life and my career so far. See you.